Great introduction, guys. Uh, my name is Gene Brewer. I'm uh, at Arizona State University, where I'm an assistant professor. Uh, I come to Arizona State from the University of Georgia. Go dogs! And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today about individual differences research and experimental research and how those work together. Okay, so usually for an international audience, which I know some people uh, over the web are, I, I, I sort of apologize for my accent. If you can't understand what I'm talking about, trust me, it's me, it's not you. I'm, I'm from the Deep South. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started. And I want to get started with a dirty little secret, okay? Uh, I want to tell you that I'm not a canine researcher. I'm not a dog researcher. I study uh, undergraduate students, and I'll tell you what we study in the lab in a second. Uh, Prescott, the organizer of the conference, gave me the opportunity to speak here, and I was mortified. I said, what, what will I ever be able to tell these people that's of any utility to their day-to-day -day life? And then I saw the list of the speakers, and I've gotten here to Symphony Hall, and I'm even more afraid of giving this presentation. So, you know, when you're afraid, what you do is, is you think, okay, well, what, can, what do I know? What do I know really well? And as Mia said, I have two dogs. I have uh, Captain Crunch, that's on the right, and I have Valentine on the left. They're both Chihuahuas. And uh, I know I don't need to tell anybody in the audience, but Chihuahuas, you know, a, right, a, a seat at the right hand of God is reserved for them. They're, they're wonderful creatures, okay? Uh, my best friend Chuck, he has a dog that he picked up from a uh, shelter, and there we go. So this is George. George is a great dog, too. Now, George has some behavioral issues, right? Now, now according to Chuck, George does not get into the furniture. He never gets on the furniture, right? According to Chuck, George never licks my feet. Right? Now, I'm telling you, George licks my feet, and, and you can see here in this picture that he, he likes to lick. George is a great dog, okay? So, so this is really my limited experience with dogs. I have my two chihuahuas, and I know a lot about my friend's dog, okay? Now, anybody that's had two dogs knows that there's individual differences in those dogs' temperaments. Right? that those dogs differ. They share the same context. They share the same owner. They share a lot of features. And, and even within a breed, they can share similar genetics, but they may have different behavioral tendencies. Dogs differ. Humans differ. Individual differences. That's differential psychology. That's what we study there. And we also know, and this is very important for this audience, that we need to come up with treatments. We need to come up with interventions. We need to find ways to change dog behavior. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to take this opportunity to talk to you about some research that I do and how it can translate into canine research on using an individual differences approach to understand behavior and then combining that with an experimental approach to find out not just whether my treatment works, but who does it work for and in what context. So we call that looking for aptitude by treatment interactions in psychology. Okay, now a little, little elevator pitch from my laboratory. I study memory and attention control. I'm interested in how people orchestrate their memory and their attention systems to achieve goal-directed behavior. So when you need to think about the future and plan, when you need to study for an upcoming test. Most of us have taken driving tests, right? We have to learn information. And when you need to sustain in, in your attention for long periods of time, I'm very interested in how you regulate yourself to achieve those types of goals, okay? And, and like a lot of psychological phenomena, that type of control is a latent phenomena. Right? It's a latent process. I can't see it. I can't touch, taste, or feel it, unfortunately. It's hard to sort of measure it. So I have to use different types of research methodologies. I use methodologies from experimental research. I use methodologies from differential or individual differences research. We do some neuroimaging in my lab. We do EEG and fMRI studies, and we're also starting to do transcranial direct current stimulation studies. And, and we use techniques from applied psychology. We, we use toys, and we try to study behavior in more naturalistic settings. And why would anybody use all of these different research methodologies? I do it because I'm trying to triangulate the phenomena that I'm studying because I can't just go out and grab it. And I'm hoping that each one of these techniques will give me a little something different, 
I'm looking for something complementary to the other techniques so I can get a better idea of the thing that it, I'm studying. This is a very old idea. Okay, so we have this famous Indian parable of six blind men who are tasked with trying to describe what an elephant is. And each of the blind men have a different hand on a different part of the elephant. And if you ask each blind man individually, what is an elephant? They're going to give you a radically different description from the other men. Right? It's only when we can put these descriptions together that we can try to get a more... I, I'm sorry, we can get a better sort of idea for the true nature of the elephant. Does that make sense? And so that's what I'm kind of doing. I'm using these different techniques to study something that I'm blind to. This idea uh, moved into psychology in the 50s, uh, the idea of converging operations. This was sort of at the tail end of the behaviorist period and the beginning of the cognitivist period, where we were trying to figure out whether or not studying perception, which is an internal process, was a good idea, or whether we should just study the behavior that we were looking at. And the argument that Garner, Hake, and Erickson put forth was the idea of converging operations. If, if we can use multiple operations to triangulate a phenomena, even if it's a latent phenomena, we can be somewhat convinced that that phenomena exists. Okay, so, so it, it, it's got a long history, it came into psychology in the 50s, and, and we're using it now in my lab. And, and what I'm hoping is that maybe this type of idea will be useful for canine researchers. Okay. Now, Let's talk a little bit about experimental methodology and individual differences methodology so we can all be on the same page. Okay? Now this is Sir Ronald Fisher. Sir Ronald Fisher was the person who came up with the ability to take the variability in a set of measures and parse it into explained variance and unexplained variance. So for example, this, we've got math up here, but it doesn't have to be crazy mathematics. It's very simple. Think about size. Right? So all humans vary in their size, and we have an average size. Okay? So some people are bigger than the average, some people are smaller than the average. This equation just simply reflects variability around the average. And Fisher's contribution was that we could take that variability and, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God, too many equations, I'm sorry. But we, Fisher's point was simply that we can take that variability, we can pump it through probability calculus, and we can derive two different sources of variability. The variability that was due to our treatment and the variability that's just error. And you know what? Individual differences pumps in error variability. Fisher didn't care about that. He only wanted to know about the treatment. And then he put this into a decision framework which allows us to be able to infer whether or not our treatment truly did cause a change in behavior or a change in crop yields or a change in whatever it is that we're measuring and studying, okay? Causal inference, it's a big, big issue with experimental psychology. Next up is Galton, Sir Francis Galton. Uh, Galton was a polymath. He studied many, many different phenomena, naturally occurring phenomena. With, with specific regard to individual differences, he was the uh, scholar who developed the correlation coefficient. Now, Galton used the exact same variability equation. Okay? So no different from what uh, the previous researcher was using. But instead of trying to take the variability in a set of measures and parse it into explained and unexplained, Galton was more interested in associating that variability to something else. So for example, size may correlate with speed. Makes sense. As you get bigger, you're probably gonna get slower. Right? So he tried to develop the mathematics of relating two measures together. And I, I put some correlations up here so we can see, right? When you have two measures, that's just your x and y axis. In the top left panel, you see a correlation of one, which is a perfectly linear correlation. That means per unit change in you know, size, there may be a per unit change in some other uh, measure. You've got a weak correlation to the right of that. You've got no correlation in the bottom right. And then you've got a negative correlation. So that would be size and speed, right? As my size goes up, my speed slows down. 
Okay? And, and so we can use this mathematics to understand something about associations. Okay? Now, three major points that I want to tell you about these two methodologies. Okay? First major point, if you are a research scientist, it is critical that when you're working, you keep your hand on your forehead, right? <laughs> it's critical. Or else you're never going to be able to come up with the type of discovery that transcends generations of researchers after you. So anytime that I see somebody around with a camera, the first thing I do is I hand goes up to them. So, so that's very, very important. Second thing that's important is the mathematics here were developed for two different reasons. One reason that the mathematics was developed, Fisher, was for inferring causal processes through some manipulation, okay? The mathematics that Galton developed was for looking at associations that are occurring in the natural world. Now, of course, the experiments happen in the natural world, but, you know, give me a little bit of latitude here, right? So, so, so these things are kind of going in opposite directions. Okay? What I want to tell you is that there's some overlap between these two. They're both talking about variability. They're both talking about relationships. And what I want to do is I want to see whether or not we can think about combining these two approaches and looking for effects that might be useful. And I'm telling you that in psychology, in educational psychology, and in other fields, we're already doing this. And in some cases, it's been very, very effective. So maybe this would be something that would be useful for canine researchers, for dog psychologists. Uh, really, the fever pitch happened in 1957. Mandatory reading for anybody that's interested in psychology or for students of psychology is Lee Cronbach's APA address, uh, where he talked about the two disciplines of psychology. Uh, the experimental approach and the differential approach, individual differences, had sort of moved into psychology, and the two never talked with one another. So you had experimentalists that were like, ah, Correlation doesn't infer, you can't infer causation from correlation. Correlations don't really tell you anything. There's always an infinite number of post hoc, you know, criticisms. And then the differential psychologists were saying, well, you don't really have the ecological validity. You're doing these experiments in these tightly controlled, contrived settings. And you can't really talk about what's happening in the natural world. So you can see that this even happened within psychology, right? That these things grew as separate research methodologies. And Kronbach was saying, he, he was really ahead of his time, that we can use these together. We should talk more. Okay? Now I'm going to fast forward a little bit, and I'm going to go all the way up to this presentation. You're probably wondering, what on earth does this have to do with dogs? Okay? So it, it, if you've sort of checked out, come back. And I'm going to try to give you an example that will help you sort of see how this works with dogs. I'm going to talk about doing research with dogs with a little thought experiment. And we're going to take the same set of dogs, and we're going to do an experiment on them, and we're going to do an individual differences study on them, and then I'm going to show you how we can use them together. Okay? So does anybody know where these dogs are from? These are six famous mascots from U.S. colleges. Okay? I had to slip in Ugga. Right? That's the University of Georgia mascot, wonderful bulldog. Right? I, I would have put in ASU's mascot, but it's a sun devil, so it <laughs> didn't, really, didn't really fit with what I was trying to do here. Right? So, uh, now, what does this have to do with dogs? When you're a mascot, there's a lot of travel. There's a lot of petting. There's a lot of having to be in these loud, chaotic environments. It's a very stressful job. So maybe we could improve these dogs' lives if we could develop some type of treatment that would help them gain sort of muscle mass, like a health intervention, okay? As an experimental psychologist, I say, okay, great, give me the theory, right? We develop a treatment based on the theory, and then we've got to do an experiment to find out whether or not that treatment is effective, okay? So what we would do, for example, is we would measure their muscle mass, okay? We would give the intervention or the treatment, and then we would measure their muscle mass again. And we would see whether or not there was a significant change in the dog's muscle mass. And if there were, we would say, look, this is a good treatment intervention for improving these dogs' physical health. Okay? 
Very, very simple. That's how an experimental psychologist would attack that problem. Now, as a differential psychologist, and I'm interested in individual differences, that's not quite how I'm going to look at this problem. I'm going to look at this problem and I'm going to say, wow, those are really cool dogs. I wonder how I could rank order them. I wonder what dimension would be an important dimension for thinking about strength and being able to handle this type of job. Maybe the dog's size. Maybe size would be a good one. So I could take these dogs and I could rank order them in terms of their size. So I've got the biggest dog on the left now and the smallest dog on the right. Okay, and, and I may be interested in seeing which ones of these dogs are going to be the most responsive to life on the road, to the hectic schedule of being a college football mascot. And I could measure that, and then I could correlate size with their responsivity to being a mascot, to the, to the pressure that that takes. Is everybody following me? Now, now, here's the point of my talk. Now, here's the critical thing. People are already doing this type of research in dogs. They're doing experiments, they're doing individual differences research. Maybe we can put the two together. So now I'm looking for an aptitude by treatment interaction. So I have my dogs rank ordered by size now, and I have a experimental design where I do the pretest, the post test, uh, the treatment, and the post test with the idea being. This is just a thought experiment, but the idea being that dogs that already are big in size may have a bigger frame. So they may see bigger pre-test to post-test gains from my intervention. And dogs that are smaller, I think it's Carnegie Mellon's mascot, dogs that are smaller, they don't have as big of a frame, so my intervention, my treatment, it may not be as effective for those dogs. So now I can start talking about who will my treatment be effective for and when will it be effective. And maybe there's different types of treatments for different types of dogs. And you can start playing with this idea. So, so I started, once I did this thought experiment, I thought, oh, okay, this works. I can see how this works. Then I started saying, well, the first thing we need to do is we need to see whether or not there's individual differences in dogs. Okay, now clearly, we've got individual differences in biological characteristics. Dogs differ in their size, they differ in their height, their speed, they differ in their genetic makeup, they differ in their breed. Lots of differences in dogs biologically. Do dogs differ behaviorally? Captain Crunch right, and Valentine, they differ dramatically in their temperament. Okay, so their behavioral tendencies are certainly different. So, I went into the literature and I, just to try to get us cooking, right, to try to pump a little bit of fuel to the fire, I looked into the literature on dogs. I did the dangerous thing because I'm not a dog researcher, so I, I don't know what I'm talking about. But, but I'm going to try. And I found three places where there's some research on individual differences in dogs. And I, I want to talk to you about three papers really quickly and, and sort of give you my thoughts on these papers. And these, based on some conversations I've had with people in the crowd, these seem to be contemporary issues in canine research. So I was very, I, maybe I was lucky or maybe not, maybe... maybe Maybe people are going to tell me that I don't know what I'm doing. But I found, I found papers on personality. Right? So do dogs have a personality? Uh, and if so, how do you measure that? I found papers on paw preference. Uh, some dogs like to use the right, some use the left, and some, some use both. I'm kind of ambidextrous, so I resonate with that. And uh, are dogs sensitive to human points? So w when you point something out, uh, can the dog recognize that social cue? Okay, uh, and, and I'm going to run through these. I'm going to do the first one a little bit more slowly, and then I'm going to uh, sort of breeze through the other two to try to save a little bit of time. Okay, so personality. Personality's got a long history in uh, differential psychology. We've really studied uh, human personality, and interestingly, we've developed this five-factor model. I'm sure surely people have heard of the big five, and uh, there's other models of personality as well, but the big five has some uh, relevance here. Uh, this is the title of the paper, Personality Traits in the Domestic Dog and I have the authors and, and the uh, year there if anybody wants to look this up. I also submitted it as the uh, supplementary materials. So you should be able to get those from the Sparks webpage. Really great when you're doing individual differences research, you want big sample size. And so I was really happy to see that these researchers, they sampled over 15,000 dogs from 164 different breeds. And so they had this remarkably large sample, which is great for this type of work. They measured 
the dog's responsivity behaviorally. So, that, so they had to measure a behavior to many different types of cues in many different types of contexts. And that generates this large multivariate data set that I could talk to you about all day, but I'm not, I promise. And, and you can do some sophisticated data analyses called factor analysis, and you can say, how many underlying dimensions are there in this data? Similar to humans, they found that there are five underlying dimensions. Okay, and, and I put the dimensions here. This is what they call the dimensions. You know, I'm, th that's not important for my talk. They also showed that there's a correlation be at, between four of those dimensions. And so they said that there may be one higher order dimension of dog temperament or personality, and they referred to that as shyness boldness. Okay? So, so this is personality in dogs. Okay, that's individual differences. So let's imagine that we wanted to come up with a treatment to get George off of that chair. Right? George, we can't have you jumping in the chair, man. We got to get you out of it. Okay? So maybe we develop that treatment, and it works for George because George is a very bold dog. But what if that treatment doesn't work for Captain Crunch? Because Captain Crunch is a very shy dog. I know you can't tell from the picture, but he's a very shy dog. He's, he's very calm. He doesn't, he does, just like this one, actually. So we develop the treatment, we do the pretest, and then we do the post-test, and we find that this type of treatment for a behavioral problem changes as a function of personality. So now we need to be able to take account of not just how effective our treatment is, but which dog is our treatment going to work for? And maybe personality could be an important individual differences characteristic that would be correlated with your treatment effect. And that's how the two connect. Is that, is that kind of good? Very good. Uh, paw preference. They, they put a little piece of paper on the dog's nose. This is my reading of it. And then they measure whether the dog hits it off with its right hand or, or with its right paw or its left paw. And some dogs really prefer prefer the right paw, and some really prefer the left paw, and some are ambidextrous. That actually says something about laterality in the brain. So it says something about the organization of the brain and the way that the brain's working. Uh, and this is a contemporary issue because it's related to immune system functioning. And what these researchers found, they sampled 80 dogs, and then they went in and did some biological measurements on 18 of those dogs, and they chose six left paw dogs, six right paw dogs, and then six ambidextrous paws. And uh, the, they found that the percent, percentage of lymphocytes and the percentage of granulocytes, so, so these uh, cells that are very important for immune system functioning, are different in the left paw dogs than they are in the right paw dogs. Okay, so handedness, pawedness, whatever you want to call it, paw preference, is an important individual differences factor that has something to do with immune system functioning. So if you're interested in studying the effects of some treatment on immune system functioning, you probably want to take account of whether or not the dog is right pawed or left pawed. That would be an aptitude by treatment interaction and how you could start to think about that. One more, here we go, sensitivity to human points. I want to make a point with this one. Uh -huh. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about breed differences in dog sensitivity to human points. This is a meta-analysis done by the organizer of this conference, Prescott Breeden. His advisor, uh, who's Clive Wynn, some of you may know Clive, he, he's an absolutely fabulous scholar. And they did a meta-analysis and they showed that dogs are capable of following human points to uh, locate food. Okay, so, so that's good, right? Dogs are sensitive to social cues. They should be, right? We co-evolved we co together, so that it's not particularly surprising. What I found particularly surprising was that this uh, ability didn't really differ across breeds, okay? Now, this is an important thing in uh, individual differences research because we want to know what types of abilities are conserved across breeds and across species. Okay, and it's really an argument for domain generality in behavior. So this type of behavior is general across all contexts and across all people versus domain specificity. This type of ability is only specific to this current context in this current situation. Okay, so we want to, it's, it's an interesting question. 
right? Whether or not these abilities are domain specific or domain general, and then whether or not our treatments are effective in all domains or not. So you're trying to put these pieces together, context, the dog, and the effectiveness of what you're doing to the dog to change its behavior. Now, uh, hopefully, We've got some take-home messages here that'll be useful. That was my point, was to try to get us to a place where maybe you would start thinking about looking for aptitude by treatment interactions in, in, in your doggy daycare, in the places where you house dogs, in your research about dogs, or in any place where you have lots of dogs simultaneously, and that it would generate a more enriched perspective on how to do this type of research. So I've got four take-home messages, if I remember. One, we know that we can use experimental methodologies to study dog behavior. It's not a surprise to anybody. We're doing that. Uh, two, we can use individual differences to study dogs. I showed you three examples of that. Uh, usually individual differences need big sample sizes, and so a lot of uh, places where it's hard to do research, you don't see a lot of individual differences studies. So I tried to give you three studies that sort of show that with dogs we can do that. Uh, the third is that we can use converging operations. When we're interested in dog behavior or dog psychology, we shouldn't just use one methodology, we should use multiple methodologies to study that behavior so we can help triangulate it and we can understand how to manipulate it and we can understand how to change it, okay? And then finally, I wanna say that if, if I'm lucky and this does generate some enthusiasm and some research, that maybe this is gonna be applied, this research can be applied in more real world settings. So when we're trying to predict outcomes for sheltered dogs, when we're trying to think about selection of service dogs, when we're trying to think about behavioral change interventions and we're trying to get a better perspective on how this is gonna work and for which dogs it's gonna work, that it'll make the world a better place. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you. And I'd like to uh, also tell you about my lab. So the Memory and Attention Control Lab, this is all the people who work for me, they're really great. Uh, also, it's important for me to acknowledge the funders who fund my research, uh, ASU's helped out a lot. Uh, we've had money from DARPA and the Air Force, and uh, also the FCT program funds one of my graduate students. So with that, thank you very much.